everybody. Welcome to our downtown studios. I'm John Ramgeen. He is Robin Black. And when you think about all the numbers that's going on right now, UFC 202, 203, 204, 205, some of the biggest names in mixed martial arts history. You have something for the old school fans. You got something for the new age fans and everything in between going down this weekend. We got to talk about maybe the biggest rematch in UFC history. I know it's a lot of hype, but it has to be real. Conor McGregor, clearly a massive star. Nate Diaz, Nathan Diaz, clearly a massive star. Two real martial artists, two real fighters. And that's why this fight is going to be spectacular. It's not about press conferences. It's not about all the trash talk. It's about the beauty that we're going to get to see in the cage on Saturday. Yeah, you know, uh, Conor McGregor doesn't think he does trash talk. He thinks he just honest talks. And uh, it seems to be true. He seemed to deviate for a little while. If you do something well and you get rewarded for it, whether that's money or applause or whatever, you sometimes are encouraged to do more of it. So he would say hilarious things, he'd provoke, and he was rewarded for that. But it distracted him from the art of training, improving, fighting, skill development, athletic development, uh, game planning, all of that. He focused so heavily on being a star that you forget sometimes what got you to the dance. And uh, so now he's refocused with his coach and they have taken everything that they've learned uh, losing to the great Nate Diaz. Everything they experienced losing to the great Nate Diaz and they believe they have the answer to go back and win. We'll see. We're gonna move on from UFC 202 because we know everybody's tuning in this weekend. I'm sure we've shoved it down your throat enough. We're going to move Still on to 203, more. a fight that, you know, not a lot of people are really talking about right now because we're kind of looking at what's on our plate right, right now, and it is a sensational matchup for the UFC Heavyweight Championship of the World. Two maybe of the best athletes to ever compete for the title. Stipe Miocic looking to defend, but he is in tough as he is taking on an even craftier Alistair Overeem than we've ever seen him inside of the cage or inside of the ring. He has a wealth of fight experience, and I think really we're going to see a peaking Alistair Overeem. I agree with you, and Alistair Overeem uh, doesn't eat as much horse meat yeah. as he used to eat. Can't. He, he can't. He, you can still eat horse meat. It's, Why would they, you want you, to? USADA doesn't test for horse meat. It's tasty. Uh, but uh, he is focused less on being big and strong and whatever, and take that however you may. And, uh, and so now, what has he done? He's a little less aggressive. He's a little less ornery. He's a little less reliant on power. And, and like you said, crafty is a perfect word for it. He's setting traps for these guys. He's training them within the fight. He's teaching them to do what they think is right, and it's wrong, and he's knocking these guys out. It's going to be a tough test for our friend Stipe, man. Uh, Stipe is a talented guy. Stipe is the real deal, but this is by far the toughest fight he's ever had. UFC 204, the rematch between Michael Bisping and Dan Henderson. I love this matchup. Uh, Michael Bisping, the favorite going into the rematch, despite the fact that Hendo knocked him out in the first fight. And if anybody should learn anything about rematches, Michael Bisping should yes. certainly know something about that. It's like, yeah, people were counting me out the first time uh, against Luke. After losing to Luke Rockwell, they're counting me out the second time. Look what I did. I'll be able to do it again against an aging Dan Henderson. And I would imagine that's one of the reasons why he's the favorite. Yes, and I agree he should be the favorite. And Mike is forever underappreciated. He's now the middleweight champion in the world, and they still underappreciate his special talents. But there's one flaw in that Anderson Silva fight, and it just about got him killed. You know what I mean? That one flaw, that focus, that letdown of focus in the Anderson Silva fight was almost the end to him. And had Silva not over-exaggerated his celebration while the referee was, you know, still saying, hey, I haven't stopped the fight and all that, it's over. He's not the middleweight champion of the world. He doesn't get that rematch. And uh, so if he lets down against Hendo, because Hendo's last uh, knockouts, Hendo's become, again, you get a little bit older and you have to work towards your brains. Hendo's been finding those little cracks, those little cracks within the fight and knocking fools out. And that's what he'll do to Mike if Mike doesn't just get this one exactly right for 25 minutes or less. One thing we know about Dan Henderson, we know he's durable, we know he's intelligent, we know that he's experienced, and we know what the game plan is for Dan Henderson. He's just coming forward, using his experience, trying to... When we took that seminar with Faraz, talking about uh, Marcelo Garcia, always mm -hmm. trying to take it to a specific side, Dan Henderson wants to corral everybody in to the right hand, much like Conor McGregor does for the left hand. Is that still the strategy when you're getting close to 50, or are you trying to evolve? Because if we're talking about it, Michael Bisping mm -hmm. and his team knows it. 
Yeah, uh, Dan Henderson has worked around being smarter, there's no question, and ornery, and greasy. You know, like, uh, he's just become that ornery, mean old bastard that lives down the street and, and sprays kids with the hose. He, that's how he fights now, and it's super cool to see, because when you're closing down on 50, you gotta, you gotta change. And Henderson has just found that greasy, grimy, mean yeah. hole in the thing. You get on my lawn, and I shoot you with my shotgun. Just corralling you into different things. That, that elbow yeah. again, oh man, that, that was beautiful. Grabbing Shogun and Throwing blasting him into it. These are, these are old man approaches, and they're beautiful to see. That's why Mike has to, his focus in this preparation, his focus needs to be on focus. The fact, he needs to be focused and sharp and present in every moment against uh, in, in this fight against Dan Henderson. If he is, he's going to win this fight. He can yeah. he can um, manipulate, him, he can outpoint him, him, keep him at distance, yeah. not make any mistakes, and Mike wins this fight. But you make one little mistake against that mean old son of and he's going to get you. What, what I love right now is we're getting a better understanding of what's going on in the 185-pound division. The middleweight picture getting a little bit clearer. We see this rematch between Dan Henderson and Michael Bisping, and I love Michael Bisping. Just to have Dan Henderson become a UFC champion just would and be... And then retire. And then retire would be one of the greatest things uh, for the sport of mixed martial arts. Certainly for a pioneer of Dan Henderson, he certainly deserves it. But underneath that, you get uh, this new age fighter, this Gegard Mousasi. When you think about well-rounded fighters, when you think about fighters that really don't have any weaknesses, I think Mousasi is certainly among those fighters when you refer to it because of his experience, because of his, his, his demeanor, because of his approach to the game. Now, taking on Vitor Belfort, he can leapfrog a couple of, of guys, including Jacques Ray, who, which he lost to, to possibly get a, a crack at the middleweight championship. How does he approach this fight with Vitor? Gegard has that weird blend that it's very hard to acquire uh, of youth and experience. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's still young, and he's just fought everybody already. And he's done it with sort of a relaxed, mellow expression. That's what you got to do, Vitor. You know what, what you're getting. This, he's a swarm of killer bees coming at you in that first round. And, it, and you need to be able to manage that. And one of the great ways to be able to approach that is with a calm demeanor, and that's what Gegard has. If Gegard is not knocked unconscious or knocked down and choked out in the first round, Gegard's going to win that fight. He's going to control the distance. He's going to tax Vitor when he comes in. He's going to get Vitor relegated to fighting on the outside, and then he's going to beat him up when he moves forward. We could see a new player at uh, the 185-pound division, Rashad Evans, uh, the former 205-pound champion, dropping down to take on Tim Kennedy in New York City at UFC 205. Uh, I'm sure Chris Weidman is doing whatever he needs to do to make sure that he gets ready and he's prepared uh, to pro probably face off with Luke Rockhold in a rematch. However, you'd want to see that for a championship. Uh, but uh, Yo Romero in the mix, uh, Jacques Array in the mix, and who knows, uh, Nick Diaz could be ready to fight at 185 pounds too. Uh, I want to talk about Rashad Evans. Do you like the move to 185 pounds? I do. I, what I, the, the, your hesitation is it feels like a last ditch effort for Rashad. And you hate that feeling for some of these. Rashad's a fighter's fighter, yeah. man. Anyone has ever worked with Rashad has nothing but great things to say about him. Rashad's been a champion. Rashad is a star in his own right. He's a great analyst. He's one of these guys you want to see do well. And you hope, as much as we from the outside might look at it and say, last shot, Rashad, 185, you hope he doesn't look at it that way. He looks at it as just fighting. Uh, it's something he's great at. It's something he's dedicated his adult life to and just approaches it like, hey, man, I fight. I, I like Tim Kennedy as, a, as an opponent to him. Tim Kennedy has a, a real dominance in wrestling. You saw when he beat Mike, uh, he, he took some dominating positions in wrestling. I don't think you can do that against Rashad. So I like this as an opponent for Rashad. I don't like it. I'll tell you why I don't like it because Tim Kennedy is so durable I talk about Alistair Overeem being crafty Tim crafty is or Tim Kennedy is crafty he's experienced he's tough as nails you can't look particularly good against Tim Kennedy I haven't seen anybody really put on uh, that of a dominating performance I think Luke Rockhold might have, but uh, I, I, I really just don't like this fight. I think that you need, especially Tim Kennedy, who hasn't been in the spotlight for quite some time, but if Rashad Evans can go out mm -hmm. and have a dominating performance, then it's like, okay, this guy is back in the mix. He is a player at 185 pounds. Yeah, Tim Kennedy's rugged. There's no doubt about it. And he's tough. He's just a man. He's a tough man, military guy. Exactly. You know, mentally tough. Yeah, it's hard to look great against him. And you, you talk about him being out of the 
the spotlight. He's been hunting some kind of Hitler history on <laughs> yeah. TV. He's got lots of Twitter followers. He gets people talking. So there is value in him as an opponent. But, yeah, he can go out and beat Rashad. And if he does, where does Rashad go? That's what's happening over the next couple of months. A uh, number of big shows happening. But the biggest possibly happening this weekend. Tune into FN this Thursday, August 18th at 7 p.m. for our one-hour preview show as we get you set for the rematch between Conor McGregor and Nathan Diaz at UFC 202.